Yeah, check. Yeah. Do it. Uh, okay. So the last the last presentation for today would be about the GDOGR project, the status, future, and uh, it will be presented by Frank Warmerdan and Evan Wool. Please. Okay. Thank you for your patience, everybody, and uh, for the move and everything. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so we're going to try and go, it's unfortunate, I can't see it too, but okay. Uh, so today we're going to go over the GDAL OGR project, a little bit about uh, the current status, a little bit about the history as well, uh, try and talk about the community and some future features. Is that catching, Jody? Where? Oh, there you go. No idea. Okay, we, we can't tell? All right. We're also trying to record, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I worked at PCI Geomatics back in the 1990s, uh, building things, one of the technologies of which was GeoGateway. GeoGateway was sort of a progenitor of GDAL OGR, so it was another multi, another uh, multi-format spatial library. Uh, I was also, so about 1998, I became the founder of the GDAL OGR project uh, when I left PCI. Uh, operated as a consultant through most of the 2000s. A lot of that work was around GDAL and around uh, map server and some related technologies. I'm um, also a maintainer of some other sort of low-level libraries, none of which I actually wrote myself, but which kind of fell out of love with their original creators, and but were important, so I helped take care of them. So libtiff, libgeotiff, and proj.4, for example. I'm a founding director of OSGEO, and I'm now working at a company called Planet Labs that makes small satellites for imaging, Earth imaging, and I'm working on the data pipeline team there. I worked at uh, Google for a couple years before that. I just moved. We tried. It seem to be unsuccessful. Yes. Oh, oh we can dim all the lights. Okay. <laughs> it's impossible. Oh. <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, so I'm Evan Rouault. I currently work at Sagem Defense Security, uh, which is a French-based uh, company uh, in the field of uh, defense, uh, aeronautics, optronics, and security system. Uh, I've been involved in quite a few software projects uh, around uh, tactical information systems, uh, mission planning systems for helicopters, for example, and currently uh, I'm uh, involved in uh, uh, embedded software uh, in an uh, optronics uh, device. And <laughs> I've been a contributor to the Goodall OGR project uh, since 2007. Uh, and uh, since uh, this year, I'm also uh, partly available as a freelance uh, developer on Goodall OGR and map server technologies. Okay, a little background on the project. Uh, so GDAL OGR is a data abstraction library. So basically it's attempting to provide a C++ library that gives you access to many different uh, geospatial formats, both raster, which is the GDAL side, and vector, which is the OGR side, um, through one common API. So you can write an application without really worrying too much about what the underlying format is. Uh, so it provides read-write read -write access to many formats. Some of them are read-only, some are read-write. Uh, it's widely used uh, in both uh, free and open source software and also in proprietary software. So some noteworthy packages are Grass, Map Server, QGIS on the open source side. And on the proprietary side, packages like FME, ArcGIS, and Google Earth uh, also use um, some or all the library. The project is about 14 years old at this point, so it was launched uh, late in 1998. Uh, it is a project of OSGEO, so it was a founding project of the foundation when it was created. And it it's under an MITx uh, sort of open source license, so a non-reciprocal license. Uh, features, uh, so it has a coordinate system support that's built around the uh, OpenGIS simple, sorry, a, a well-known text format for describing coordinate systems. So that's the same as you'd find in the uh, 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 simple features for databases, for instance, that sort of thing. Uh, it has utilities for doing translation, image warping, subsetting, and a variety of other things. So, sorry, command line utilities, I should say. It is uh, also a endeavors to uh, provide efficient access to the underlying format. So to the extent that the format and whatever libraries we depend on uh, can give efficient access, we try not to add too much overhead, at least for an application that uh, you know, endeavors to do things efficiently. Uh, so for instance, w if it's a tiled format, we can extract subtiles uh, efficiently and expose that to the application. If there's overviews, we can use that to extract uh, reduced resolution uh, requests efficiently, uh, things like that. 
Uh, it's written in C++ with a uh, C linkage library on top, so that if, if, when we do calls from other languages like Python and so on, we usually try to call through the C library because it's a more stable API. And it has li language bindings for a variety of languages. The ones that are well maintained are Python, Perl, C Sharp, and Java. And there's been a few others that have sort of come and gone or in a state of some disrepair. Um, but those are the ones that are wi fairly widely used and fairly well supported. Uh, so the GDAL side I mentioned before is the raster side, and the OGR is the vector side. So the raster side supports um, a wide variety of formats. So this is not an intended to be a comprehensive list. What I want to give a sense, though, is that there's a, a variety of different sort of flavors of formats or categories. So for instance, there's plain, plain raster formats, things that you would think of as consumer formats that you might use with your camera or just normal imaging applications, so JPEG, PNG, GIFs, things like that. There are geospatial formats, so GeoTIF, uh, it would be a TIFF plus some georeferencing information. Um, AirDAS Imagine, NITF are examples of, uh, this is sort of formats that are fairly custom to the geospatial domain, but they're still basically regular formats on disk. Uh, a bunch of wavelet formats, so JPEG 2000, Mr. SID, and ECW. So in these cases, for instance, we depend on underlying libraries to actually access the, the data. Uh, RDBMSs, so Oracle Raster, PostGIS Raster, are a couple of examples of that, so we try to you basically are, instead of using a file name, you're using a connection string sort of information to get at those. Also a variety of web services, so in particular WMS and WCS, uh, using GDAL as a client to those is uh, somewhat popular. Uh, actually, uh, so in the early 2000s, I did a lot of work for a company that was focused on radar data, so there's a bunch of different radar formats that are quite well supported along with various metadata, and uh, in fact, one of the data types for GDAL is uh, uh, complex numbers, um, where a pixel value can have a real and an imaginary component, and that's important for some radar products. So CIOS and NVSAT are examples of a couple of formats in that field. Uh, elevation formats, so DTED and USGS, DEM are a couple. Also, there's a, sort of a special SRTM height format and a few other less common ones that are well supported. Container formats, so HDF uh, 4 and 5 and NetCDF are what I think of as scientific formats, but they're basically uh, a single file where you can encapsulate a bunch of different products. So it could be different sensors off of one satellite, it could be different data layers that are different resolutions. So really, in that, in that sense, we call them a container because they contain um, several of what GDAL would consider to be a data set. So that because the different <coughs> data chunks can be at different resolutions, potentially different regions. Um, and also a variety of sort of special formats. So uh, there's an in-memory format, so you can just do everything uh, to a block of RAM. Uh, and uh, VRT is a virtual format, so it's basically write a little XML file that describes how it would actually use other files or files, put them fi single file or other files, put them together in a certain way, things like that. So it's a sort of a virtualized mechanism. And there's over 100 formats, but I want to give you a sense that there's really different flavors, so they're not just all conventional files on disk. Uh, and for the most part, so I mentioned that some of these actually require external libraries. Some of them obviously depend on uh, HTTP protocol and things like that. Uh, but then a fair number of them are actually built uh, completely into GDAL. So for something like Airdas Imagine is a fairly complicated format where everything's actually built into GDAL. It's part of the default configuration. Something like uh, ECW format, you actually require an external library and it's an optional, an optional format. OGR, so OGR is the vector side. OGR doesn't stand for anything anymore. At one time I was... Uh, Hubris, hubristic enough uh, to, to think that it was going to stand for OpenGIS reference, but there is no C++ OpenGIS uh, API, and it was, you know, rather presumptuous on my part. So now it stands for nothing. <laughs> uh, it also depends on uh, OGC well-known text as the coordinate system format, uh, and it's very tightly bound to the OpenGIS simple features data model uh, for geometries. Uh, actually, still the sort of traditional uh, Rev one, I guess, geometry model. We'll talk a little bit about uh, advances in that world. It also has a bunch of command line utilities for doing things like data translation, uh, query, uh, reprojection, uh, subsetting. It also has bindings for the same set of la languages. So I didn't mention it before, but the bindings are actually implemented using SWIG, which is this technology that allows you to build bindings for several languages fairly easily based on one definition. There is still a bunch of custom stuff per language because we try to make it fit in a little bit better than it might by default. Um, but that does, uh, while making it very complicated for us to figure out how the bindings actually work, because there's a bunch of magic in SWIG, it does actually help us support several languages reasonably conveniently. Um, OGR uses a library called GEOS, another C++ library for doing its more sophisticated geometry operations. So things like intersections between polygons, is a point in a polygon, those sort of operations are actually done using GEOS. 
uh, and OGR actually provides sort of a cover API that uh, exposes some of those capabilities. Um, and uh, GIOS is actually an optional dependency. So if it's not available, then, for instance, spatial searches are strictly bounding box searches. If, if GIOS is available, then we can actually do, you can give it a spatial region, which is a polygon, and it would actually only find objects that intersect that polygon. Um, it also has a pseudo uh, SQL language that comes with it that's for querying. So there's one that's built in, which is we call OGR SQL, which is sort of a half-assed implementation of where clauses and so forth. And it also has the ability to pass through to underlying RDBMSs, and we'll talk a little bit about how it can actually use uh, SQLite's engine uh, for any format. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly later. So also, uh, OGR has a variety of different types of formats. So there's some similarity to GDAL in this regard. So there's uh, fairly conventional GIS formats like shapefiles, map info files, uh, personal geodatabase, file geodatabase. Uh, some of which, uh, once again, depend on external libraries. So for instance, uh, file geodatabase depends on having the Esri library available. Uh, a bunch of CAD formats, DXF and DGN, I guess, primarily. I actually can't think of any other CAD formats offhand. Um, so one thing I would mention about CAD formats is CAD formats tend not to fit the uh, simple features geometry and the gen generally, generally the simple features data model very well. So they tend to be kind of lossy. CAD formats tend to have a lot of styling on a per feature basis or they try to have curves and other things that are geometrically not that well represented. So we do the best we can in these drivers to convert them to something that's a sort of a GIS rough equivalent, um, but they are lossy compared to something like a shapefile where everything maps one to one. Uh, there's what would I call Neo Geo formats, so re sort of recent simple things uh, formats are, or sort of web-based formats, so KML and GeoJSON are a couple of examples. I guess those are not really all that new anymore. I still think of them as new. Uh, also web services, so web feature service is the OGC standard for accessing features and basically is exchanging GML fragments over the web. Fusion tables is another uh, HTTP-based uh, thing, Google, that's Google Fusion tables. Uh, a wide variety of national formats, so it used to be all the rage for every country or state or region to come up with their own formats, uh, uh, which they would uh, de define as standard and the government would release in those formats. So there's a bunch of those supported. Mostly you just want to escape them into more conventional formats as quickly as you can. It actually doesn't seem to be all the rage anymore, so now people are more likely to distribute in uh, GML or actually just in conventional GIS formats like shapefiles and so on. The, Love of that seems to have waned in recent years. Uh, also some miscellaneous formats. So CSV is just comma separated value files, which we can interpret some columns as a geometry definition if we want. Uh, there's also a sort of a virtual file thing where you have an XML describing what other files actually accessing. So one of the ways we actually use CSV is you would actually write another VRT, which would point at the CSV, but with, with the, the VRT would actually say, use this column as latitude, that column as lo longitude, and you could do a few other things. And there's an in-memory format, which is useful for sort of working data sets in the middle of a processing chain. Okay. Community. Um, so it, the project has existed, I said, for 13 years and has really uh, built up, I think, a fairly successful community of contributors and users, sort of regular users, and also users that are applications uh, over those years. So uh, we have about 25 active committers out of a total of 52 who are currently sort of support, uh, have commit rights <coughs> on the project. Um, the, the, oh, there's only one mailing list for the project, GDL Dev, and it's about 1,900 subscriptions. So I'm not sure how many of those people are actually receiving it, but that's a pretty good number. Uh, we had a sponsorship program, but we wound it down due to IRS pressure about a 501c3 uh, thing. So we might actually bring it back at the time it was being used to fund uh, some maintenance, some paid maintenance, and a few other community things like t-shirts and stuff like that. So we still have, I think, about 15k in our kitty, so that we can apply to those things. At some point, we might bring it back now that uh, OSGEO is a 501c4 instead. It, it loosens some of the constraints on what the foundation is actually allowed to do. Um, so in terms of health as the, in the bug system, there have been about 500 tickets filed in the last 12 months out of 5,000 over the history of the project, so that's sort of consistent with the history. And what I didn't list here actually is the number of open tickets, how many actually get closed, so <laughs> that's, uh, that, that would be another measure of health. I think we have our, like uh, 800 uh, yeah. tickets. But that means 4,200 closed, that's uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually, I, I, I don't know if we're going to position to actually follow this link. Um, Are we, uh, I, maybe that's not a good idea. Let's not try that. It's just going <laughs> to mess things up. Yeah, I don't know. Can we do that? We're not connected to the 
then you won't find you inside of range. So okay, let's just yeah. not. <laughs> okay, let's not do that. Um, uh, Google also has a, so in uh, 2005 or so, it became a, a part of the OSGEO Foundation. And one of the things we did then was we kind of came up with a governance model. We set up a project steering committee, things like that. And we came up with a mechanism for deciding on major new features or changes to the API. So we call that process an RFC process, a request for comments. We'd write up a document uh, for major changes, uh, discuss it, and then vote on it. So we've actually had two or three over the 1.10 uh, release cycle uh, RFC. So a lot of things like a new driver, as long as it fits into the existing structure, we don't have to have any real discussion. Somebody just goes ahead, writes it, and offers it, and we incorporate it as long as it doesn't have any obviously terrible things about it. We don't generally judge it too highly, on, too much on quality, just that it's not going to actually break people's builds and things like that. Um, but for notable in additions to the base API or changes, anything that would be disruptive, we have RFC. So there were a couple over the last cycle. Um, and I want to stress, Evan Roll is by far the most prolific contributor in recent years. So I was the founder, but he's been really carrying the bulk of uh, maintenance and the most prolific developer of new. I, I have to say, it's a special thrill for me. Uh, I met him for the first time this week in person, so I, we've been communicating, <laughs> obviously, for a long time. Um, but I'm very excited now that he's actually available for some freelance work and that he's getting out and everyone gets to meet him. So, All right. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you for the new release. Okay, so uh, the last table release was the 1.10.0 uh, uh, release, which was uh, uh, delivered in uh, April this year, and uh, it followed um, our typical uh, release cycle, which is uh, around the uh, yearly cycle. So this release uh, was uh, uh, 14 months uh, since uh, the 1.9 release. Uh, yes, the <laughs> 1.10 was supposed to be 2.0, but when we looked uh, at the API, API breakage, uh, there was no API breakage, so no reason to, to call it 2.0, so it was 1.10. But I think it, it caused some problems with uh, QGIS plugins that <laughs> didn't test the, <laughs> the version number uh, uh, the right way. So I, I think it, it has been fixed uh, since then. Um, and uh, and we we released a, a bug fix uh, version uh, last month. Uh, well, uh, in time uh, for for <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm I'm going to to list uh, a few recent drivers that uh, have been added uh, to 1.10. So there's a MB tiles uh, driver which is uh, currently read only. Um, so uh, MB tiles are, in uh, fact, you can look at that if you want. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, PNG or JPEG blobs uh, into uh, SQLite uh, three uh, DB, and uh, you have uh, uh, pyramid levels uh, like uh, yeah, in WMTS uh, <coughs> protocol. Uh, there's also the Arc driver. Uh, well, honestly, I, I don't know very much about it. It has been uh, contributed uh, by the, the folks uh, from uh, Azavir. Um, there's also the map driver, uh, which um, which can open uh, OZ Explorer uh, files and uh, recognize uh, uh, the special way they, they express uh, the projection and uh, uh, georeferencing. Uh, there's also the DDS uh, driver, which is a uh, write-only. Uh, DDS stands for uh, Direct Door Surface. It's a, a 3D uh, uh, texture uh, format. Um, there's a C -tabel t uh, table to format. Maybe if, uh, I think Frank uh, contributed it. Uh, he can maybe explain a bit more of it. Right, so uh, one of the things I've been trying to use GDAW for is processing datum shift files. So ctable2 is one datum shift file. So there's been others added in recent history, of the NTV2 format and things like that. So mostly just so that we can use GDAW when we're doing the preparation and conversion and stuff like that for new datum shifts. And uh, there's also the Iris uh, driver, which uh, also has been contributed by uh, the folks who who have produced these, these formats. This is uh, about a uh, uh, weather radar format. Um, we have also a new vector uh, in uh, OGR 
in the OGR part uh, of uh, the library. Uh, the ODS uh, format, ODS is a spreadsheet format uh, from uh, OpenOffice. And uh, uh, it's clone, <laughs> yeah, XLXX, which is a Microsoft uh, version, <laughs> I would say, of uh, ODS. Uh, both are pretty close. Uh, well, it's uh, XML uh, in, a, in a zip. Uh, those drivers uh, can uh, can read uh, yes <coughs> pretty basic uh, spreadsheets. Uh, uh, they uh, they will have problems if you use uh, complicated formulas. <laughs> so if you want to use them, uh, you you might have to uh, paste uh, the formulas uh, as values uh, rather than as formulas. Um, and I think uh, a popular driver would be the uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, driver. It uh, can process both the uh, XML uh, OSM uh, files, uh, also the PBF, uh, which is a compressed uh, format uh, with a protocol buffer. Um, this form, uh, the driver is a, a bit particular uh, in which uh, uh, way uh, OpenStreetMap uh, uh, writes uh, geometry uh, does not uh, really follow the uh, simple feature geometry model, so uh, we have to uh, <laughs> to build uh, uh, lines and polygons uh, with a temporary database uh, from the nodes and uh, descriptions uh, of the way from nodes and uh, polygons uh, from the uh, relations uh, which are made of ways and extra. Uh, there's also the PDF uh, driver. Um, which can uh, read or write uh, what they call vector structured PB uh, PDF. Uh, you can, uh, in uh, in Acrobat, you can uh, uh, see each uh, each feature, and you can select it, and uh, it will be uh, highlighted uh, in the uh, in the software. So it it can be a kind of a poor man uh, GIS viewer, uh, and also. Um, in uh, 1.10, uh, the GDAL PDF driver uh, has been uh, improved uh, um, in many useful ways. Uh, and there's also the Elasticsearch uh, driver, which is uh, uh, currently uh, write-only. And uh, well, I, I don't know personally much about this one. In it writes uh, through uh, HTTP to uh, some uh, kind of cloud uh, server. Uh, well, <laughs> I must speed up a bit. Uh, so, uh, significant uh, improvements are uh, uh, layer uh, OGR, uh, layer algebra. We we talk a bit about it uh, later. There's also the um, SQLite uh, SQL engine, uh, the virtual uh, OGR SQLite extension, um, uh, VSI curl streaming, um, which is a uh, what we call a virtual uh, file system, uh, which enables to uh, uh, to download uh, a file in, in a streaming mode uh, and process it. Uh, there's also the API proxy mechanism, uh, which was uh, designed uh, to run uh, specific drivers in a sub-process, sub uh, in particular when uh, you, you have to deal with, uh, with data uh, that you you don't know if it will uh, crash or not the driver, it might be useful uh, to use uh, the, the API proxy. And uh, th there's also the geocoding client API, uh, which can do uh, forward and uh, reverse uh, uh, geocoding uh, with uh, uh, various uh, geocoding uh, services like uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, Nominatim, and, uh, and uh, a few other ones. Uh, another major, major feature from the release that uh, I found quite interesting is OGR Layer Algebra. So this was implemented by Erdi Yolma. Um, basically, it offers a way. We already, uh, using the GeoS library, had ways of doing geometry operations uh, between two features or between two geometries. What this basically uh, gives is a higher level API that allows you to do, for instance, intersections between two whole layers, so two entire feature sets. Um, so intersections, unions, symmetric difference, identify, and update, clip, and erase are the operations that it supports. 
Um, it, it also is depending underneath it all for GIOS to actually do the geometry operation. So it's basically air, adding a layer of management to, to, to uh, do all the features of one layer against another. Um, in it depends on spatial indexing uh, to get, if, if it doesn't have spatial indexing in the underlying data sets, then actually the implementation can be very slow. So some underlying formats, for instance, shapefiles, you can have a spatial index or the spatial databases in which uh, basically what it's going to do is it's going to take the features one by one from one layer and test them against the other layer. So that other, the, basically the layer that it's doing the tests against has to have a spatial index or it'll be quite slow. Uh, yes. Um, oh. Was there anything else here? No, that's good. Uh, so there is actually a small command line utility, uh, OGR Algebra, I think it was called, or something like that, which you can use to do these things. And there's, it's available at the API level from the various cover languages as well as C++. Um, I was going to actually, in a previous incarnation of this talk, I tried to go through this in detail, but I had trouble explaining it since I didn't understand it too well. So we'll just go through this uh, very briefly. Um, so one of the things it's doing, though, is it is uh, collecting the attributes. So when, if you do... Um, uh, join or some of these operations, it will actually take the attributes from both uh, jump, both features, uh, the feature from one layer, feature from the other layer, put them together into a, a joint uh, feature. So some of these things are around controlling how you would prefix the attribute names if there are collisions and things like that. Okay, we can go to the next. Uh, actually, I'm, so I'm not going to try and talk about this in detail, although there is this example of how you would use the uh, OGR layer algebra script. So in this case, we're telling it the operation we're telling it uh, what the input da data first data set is, what the second data set is. The second data set is called the method data set. Um, in this case, we're saying we want to capture all the fields. Um, we add a prefix of method underscore uh, to the second uh, files fields. And we output the, the result uh, to uh, basically a shape file called out. And uh, the layer that's created in there is called uh, intersection. OK. Um, so, um, in OGR, we have a, a native uh, OGR uh, SQL uh, engine, uh, which has some limits, of course, because uh, writing a full uh, compliant uh, SQL engine uh, is quite uh, a complicated job. So, the idea here was to uh, rely on uh, the SQLite uh, SQL engine, which is a uh, pretty much uh, SQL uh, 92 uh, compliant. Uh, so, and another advantage is that uh, once you have done that, you can use a specialized uh, library which uh, offers uh, many uh, um, geometry uh, operation uh, with uh, SQL. Uh, so the SQL, uh, SQL, the SQLite uh, SQL uh, direct uh, can work uh, with uh, any OGR data source, uh, and you can do uh, select, insert, uh, delete, uh, update, <laughs> so everything. <laughs> And uh, you can uh, also uh, use a uh, uh, R3 uh, specialite, uh, uh, special index, uh, which uh, enables you to you to do uh, uh, in intersection uh, queries uh, with a uh, benefit of the special index, for example. But it's just one uh, an example of of what you can do. Uh, you you can do uh, all the uh, st underscore operation, uh, which. Uh, which are available in Specialite, for example. Uh, yes, so uh, <laughs> just uh, a, few, a few hints about uh, the uh, possible um, uh, future improvements of the, of the library. So there's a, um, the grand unification. We, we have a slide about that uh, just after. Uh, we could also uh, deal with more um, simple feature uh, geometry like uh, teens, uh, uh, yeah, switching to uh, um, 2.5D uh, as the official way and dealing with curves. Uh, one one feature, one new feature, uh, is a capability of dealing with uh, multiple uh, geometry fields per feature and, and layer, which is a uh, which is a, tre a trend in the in new formats. Uh, you have that uh, in. Uh, you can do that in uh, PostGIS, in uh, Specialite, in GML, and uh, in an uh, interlist uh, format, which is a uh, uh, Switzerland uh, um, vector format. And of course, uh, even more uh, raster or, uh, vector drivers and, uh, and uh, fixing uh <laughs> or uh, several hundred uh, tickets. <laughs> um, maybe you, you want to talk about that one? 
Um, so we had always, uh, I had always hoped anyways that GDAL 2.0 would be what we call the grand unification. So when I first started out, I treated GDAL and OGR very distinctly, and they actually have quite different driver models and ways of handling metadata. So the dream here would be there would be some sort of version 2.0 where we bring a lot of those things into alignment. Uh, it's not clear whether that will ever actually happen, but. All right, so questions? Yes. So I will say um, uh, the GDAL simple features data model does not represent topology all that well, so we end up usually having to break it down then into uh, component ones. I don't know, do you have any thoughts on doing topo.json, geo.json? Uh, topo.json is, uh, is in track uh, currently. <laughs> oh, it's in, in it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, do you know what happened to the um, TPU acceleration branch from the Google Summer of Code? Strangely, I'm working with that guy now. I, so I started at Planet Labs, and this guy was introduced to me, Seth, and it turns out he's my, he was my Summer of Code student on that uh, a while ago. Uh, so he's still very actively um, doing stuff with that in sort of another context. So it's possible it will get be brought, brought back in. His, uh, our, his and my close cooperation may result in some of that stuff actually coming back. Apparently, it sort of worked at the end of the Summer Code. I never could get it working on my machine. I was never super enthusiastic about acceleration, but I do think the image warping would be a natural use for it. So there is hope for that. Uh, there was another question somewhere. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when uh, talking about OSM driver for the OGR or, or library, you have mentioned that you have certain t troubles when implementing it, right? Uh, to which degree the current implementation is uh, poor? I'm asking because we are implementing similar thing in our application stack, and there are many complex cases, like for, for example, when we have a rectangular area and only one edge of a polygon which crosses it. Are you trying to consider such edges together with the surrounding rectangular area to form a part of the polygon or do you just throw such uncertainties away? Well, currently if you, if you do a bonding box um, uh, filter, it will uh, apply on the nodes. So, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> but I, I think it's it's a, a problem that has no <laughs> real solution. You 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 need to build uh, the geometries uh, before doing clipping. Uh, well, I, maybe someone has a solution, but. <laughs> Other questions? How do you deal with OpenStreetMap tags? Is there a style file or? I mean, there are. The different uh, tags for different features in one layer? So uh, well, uh, the um, OSM driver um, can work with a configuration file uh, where you can uh, choose uh, which uh, OSM tag goes into uh, which uh, OGR field and uh, there's um, uh, remaining uh, tags <laughs> field where uh, all of the other stuff uh, can go. I just also stressed that uh, OGR itself doesn't really deal with style uh, in that much detail, so it's not actually a rendering engine, so sometimes that's a, something that gets lost with people. That Generally, you're depending on something like Map Server or QGIS to add a layer that has styling rules. So basically, we would try and expose the attributes. Yes? Uh, the VRT thing for defining virtual Belfort is a great idea, but why do you need to do it for CSV, which is quite a simple... Yes, no, I frequently kick myself about that. Uh, so there are some actual rules in the CSV file that a column is named a certain thing that I can't remember all the details where, it and we might actually improve that a little bit. If it's called uh, WKT and that you put a, a geometry into a WKT format, it will be recognized as a geometry field uh, from the layer. Any, yes? Just a comment, really. The yeah, scrapers of software that very much it's uh, Uh, well, so mostly we leave that to packagers. Uh, the <laughs> assumption is that uh, 
uh, <laughs> uh, who, to whom we owe a great deal. Um, so for instance, on Windows, there's OS Geo for W, where we try to provide uh, one build that's used by many packages with a reasonably consistent set of drivers and things like that. But it is always a problem, yes. There are many complicated dependencies which are optional. So people often find they end up with a build that doesn't have what they want. And I don't have a real good solution. I think we can have two more questions, and then we can continue outside. OK, in the middle row here. <coughs> I would like to know the status of the OpenJPEG driver. Is it, has it moved you know? to OpenJPEG 2.0 or? Yes, actually, uh, uh, GDAL 1.10 uh, will re require the uh, OpenJPEG uh, 2.0 version uh, because it uses uh, its new API to, uh, to have um, tile decoding. And there was one question at the back. So the problem with building overviews is actually less about the actual CPU, uh, CPU use. There's some terrible things about within a GeoTIFF how it moves back and forth between the overviews and the base layer that's super expensive for large files. So there's actually a serious deficiency in the, in the GeoTIFF driver that should be corrected. Um, more, that's, I think that's much more important than actually trying to utilize uh, multi-cores or something like that. So there, should, there needs to be a solution to that. And as files get big, that becomes debilitating. I, f I had a, a one guy who like ran it for like seven days to build overviews for his big file, so it's crazy. And yeah, you it's you know you could GDO translate that in like you know ten minutes, but so it's just out of control. So something's got to be fixed there, which is an action item to me. Okay, I think we're out of time. Sorry, I appreciate yeah. everyone's patience. <laughs> okay, so